Welcome to Fellowship of Wildwood Online. I can't wait till we can be together again and I can say that in person and leave off that online part. We're a church that loves to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, to weep with those who weep. Today, we're rejoicing with Tom and Phyllis Holman and their family as they celebrate their 50th anniversary. Congratulations. This week, there's a special day coming up on Thursday, the National Day of Prayer. We hope that wherever you are on Thursday, whether it's at home or traveling to the grocery store, wherever you may go, that you will be thinking about how you can pray for our nation and how we can pray that as a church, we can be together again soon in prayer together as a congregation. Today, Pastor Ryan will bring a message from the Sermon on the Mount, and he'll be sharing what it is like to be a citizen of the kingdom and how we as a citizen of the kingdom can have influence. We can be salt and light. So think about where you are. What is your circle of influence? And consider how God will use you to be his salt and his light in this world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can celebrate with those, God, who are rejoicing over the wonderful milestones in their lives, like a 50th anniversary. God, thank you for our church congregation. Thank you for a fellowship of believers, God, that we can come together and support one another. Lord, we are longing for that day when we can be physically back together again. And we pray, Lord, that until that time, that you will help us to be salt and light wherever we are. God, that you'll help us to be an influence, whether that's in our home, Lord, over Zoom calls, or when we do encounter others, God, as we are going to places that we need to go. Lord, we just look to you. We wait for you. God, we cry out to you in this time of uncertainty, and we ask, God, that you would help us to remain faithful to the call. And Lord, we long for that day when we will see you again face to face. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad you've chosen to spend part of your weekend with us. If you're new to Fellowship and just started watching online, please let us know. We'd love to share more about our ministries and how you can get connected. Just text NEW to 636-434-2727 and we'll be in touch right away. For some, this slower pace is great. For others, maybe it feels like juggling and can be overwhelming. We want to help, specifically with strengthening marriages. Don't let your relationship marriage take a back burner right now. A new group is starting soon and will walk through the Love and Respect series available on Right Now Media. Couples watch the sessions on their own, then discussion will take place in a scheduled group Zoom meeting led by one of our elders, Jeff Roark, and his wife, Janet. If you're interested, please let us know today by emailing us at connect at fellowshipofwildwood.org and we'll get you all the details. If you've been looking for a way to get involved and support our local community, we have a church-wide serve opportunity coming up this month. Circle of Concern is a food pantry serving thousands of people every year in West St. Louis County, and they need your help. We're hosting a drive through food drive to support Circle of Concern on May 17th. You can find the shopping list at fellowshipofwildwood.org slash coronavirus. All you have to do is grab a few items from the list while you're already out safely shopping. Then plan to drop them off in the drive through line at the church main entrance on Sunday, May 17th from 2 to 4 p.m. Volunteers will take the items right from your trunk. No contact needed. We're so glad you're watching today. Now, let's worship together. Well, good morning, church. We're so glad that you've joined us online for worship this morning. Would you join us as we sing of our God who's done great things? i 
reading from God's Word. We're reading from Matthew 5, 11 through 20. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross He suffered from the curse 
to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With His blood He purchased me. On the cross He sealed my pardon. Paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story How my lost estate to save In His boundless love and mercy He the ransom freely gave Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer Just me on the cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. You set me free, my ransom soul free. The darkness is over, beholding, I see a living redeemer. love song I bring you set me free I will praise my dear Redeemer His triumphant power I'll tell how the me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free you set me free my ransom soul free the darkness is over beholding I see a living redeemer love healing love song I bring you set me free my ransom soul free the darkness is over beholding I see the living redeemer love healing me forever forgiven this love song I bring you set me free a living redeemer love healing me forever forgiven this love song i bring you set me free Yeah. 
me what patience what patience would wait as we constantly roam what father so tending is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins, they are many His mercy is more What rich of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath a debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more Says they are many, his mercy is more. Good morning. It's so good to reach out and touch my church family this morning. I've missed you all, and I've missed being with you. I'd like to read a scripture this morning. Ephesians 1, 18, 19, and 20. I pray, writes Paul, that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I pray also writes Paul, that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at the right hand of God, where he is even now daily making intercession for us. Let us pray. Father, in this time when there's so many questions and really so many heartaches, we come to you and we believe that you are in control, that you are not going to let your people perish, that you have our best interests at heart, of course, because you love us, and that you're going to bring about good out of disaster. You're going to work all things together for good, just like you say in your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that 
we don't have to look to the news. We don't have to look to reports, but we can look to you. And we can place our confident faith and trust in the king of the universe who knows everything and who loves his people. And we do pray with confidence, assurance this morning, Lord, that we are loved by the creator of the universe and that he is taking an active part in our lives as we invite him in to take control of the situation. Father, I pray for every member of my church family that whatever, however they're affected, and I know some are affected more than others, Lord, but they would be very well, very aware of the confident hope we can have in you this day, right now, in this hour, because you love us. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Fellowship family. I'd like for us to begin today by thinking about an experience at a restaurant, a lunchtime uh, experience. And you may remember back in the day when, when people were able to go into restaurants and sit down in these designated areas where they could eat together and have a meal. Well, this happened during one of those times, and it was lunch, and uh, a lady that was serving as a, a waitress uh, was going to the salad bar, and she was about to refill uh, a container of salad dressing. But just as she was getting close to the salad bar, her heel caught the floor, she tripped, and an entire container of salad dressing went all over one of the customers. The man was standing there next to the, to the salad bar, and he was covered from his shoes to the top of his head with Thousand Island dressing. And uh, he immediately exploded, and he got really angry with this waitress. Even though it had been an accident, he was, he was embarrassed. He was uh, upset. He began to, to curse and to yell, and uh, he demanded to see the, to see the manager. He uh, told the manager when he came out, he, the manager said, oh, we'll, we will help you, whatever we can do to make this right. And the waitress was still there, and she had a towel, and she was trying to clean up the area and trying to clean some of the, the dressing off of him. And he said, get away from me. You have done enough already. Do you not see this suit? This is the first time I've worn this suit. And it was hundreds of dollars. And the manager said, we'll pay to have your, your suit cleaned. And he said, nope, I want a new suit. I'm not leaving here until I have a check for a brand new suit that this stupid waitress has ruined. Then they went off into the back and supposedly made things right. But think about that experience. Maybe you've been there before where someone gets upset at, uh, at one of the servers. Well, in this case, this man was wearing a suit, and so you're probably thinking of this, this businessman that was on his lunch break coming in to have a meal, but this didn't happen during the work week. This particular true story happened on a Sunday lunch, and you probably are asking, well, why was he wearing a suit? Well, he was probably coming from church that day. I wonder if he had just heard a message that day on the Sermon on the Mount. Well, that's where we're at. We're looking at a brand new series. In his words, Matthew chapters 5 through 7 is one of the most famous sermons ever preached and it was given by our Lord Jesus. And so I invite your attention back to Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, we will pick back up where we left off last week. Uh, if you were with us last week, you may re recall that the theme for the Sermon on the Mount is life in God's kingdom. And as a citizen of God's kingdom, we are called to live in a way that is distinct. It is different from the, the ways of the world that is around us. We have a different way of living, a different way of thinking, different norms and values. We have, uh, uh, we, we have a distinction that, uh, that, is, that is to be seen in the life of the believer. So as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to see examples of these distinctions. And uh, we said last week, to live in God's kingdom is to be under the reign of Jesus Christ. So uh, we said last week that some view the Sermon on the Mount as the, the manifesto given by the monarch, King Jesus. And so as we come into his kingdom and we are citizens of his kingdom, this is the way that we are called to live. And we'll be unpacking these verses over the next number of weeks. 
We gave our attention to the first 10 verses of chapter 5 last week, and uh, we noted that the opening verses serve really as an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, You uh, may recall that there are eight Beatitudes, and they begin in verse 3 and go all the way through verse 10. They speak of a blessing that is, that is given to those who are, who are following after the Lord, who are seeking Him in the ways described here in the Beatitudes. Each one of them begins by speaking a word of blessing. And we said last week that blessing, while oftentimes it speaks of being happy or content, that in a very uh, literal way it also means to be approved by God. And so uh, we know that our approval ultimately comes through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but it is also true that these are the ways that he has put forth for us to live and to approach him. And so why don't we take just a moment and read these once again, noting uh, that there is uh, a blessing, a reward, a promise attached in each one. And uh, we pick up in verse 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. We read these last week and saw them as an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. And we, uh, we, we read them and saw that there is a progression that takes place when we begin and, and look at verse 3 and, and see the idea of being poor in spirit. We understand that it's a, it's a recognition of sin, and literally that, that we are spiritually bankrupt. We see our spiritual condition for what it is. It leads us to to weep over that sin, to repent of that sin before the Lord. Uh, We we then see that that, uh, we're called to be humble or or, or meek, and it it speaks of us uh, being led by the Lord. And so each step of this, as we go through the Beatitudes, is, is showing a progression of coming to Christ, coming into His kingdom, and then growing and maturing in that walk with God. So we see that the spiritual maturity comes as one hungers and thirsts for righteousness, following after the things of the Lord, desiring a pure heart, which is really an undivided heart towards God. And, uh, and then uh, all of these things begin to make a difference. And we see that this is a person that's described as merciful, showing mercy to others. We see this as a person who is a, a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. And so those internal attitudes, those conditions begin making a change in the life of the one who is, who is looking and living uh, these beatitudes. And so I want to stop for just a moment, and I want to ask you to think about your own personal testimony. Look at, at your walk with Christ and see how does your walk with Him line up with these eight beatitudes? Can you, can you go back and, and, and maybe connect your testimony? Maybe you've written it out before, and you can connect your testimony, your journey with Christ to each of these. There's questions written there in the, uh, in the handout for you to, to, to consider. And the first one is this. Do you remember when you first came to Jesus in brokenness? Do you remember what it was like when you first saw your sin and noted that it was, it was an offense before a holy God? that deserved punishment. Maybe you also recall what it was like to to see your mourning over this sin met with comfort from Christ as He poured out His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness. It was freely given to you. And then what was your life like after you came to Christ? Do you recall your initial steps of faith, what you were learning, how you were were changing? Were there any desires or habits that 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 were changing as well? How were you being developed as a citizen in his kingdom? You see, as we look at these eight Beatitudes, they they really present a blueprint for us of how we enter the kingdom, of what those initial steps to Christ look like, our response to God. And then as we 
begin to grow in him. It is, it is detailed there for us. So it's very important that we get the right understanding of these realities uh, that, are, that are found here in the Beatitudes. Because when that happens, and when new life is given, we see that new life will be evident. Again, the theme of the Sermon on the Mount is life in the kingdom. And so if we have this new life, it's been given to us. It will be evident in the way in which we live. So if the Beatitudes serve as an entrance to the kingdom, the next verses, they, they serve and describe a witness to the kingdom. Think of it this way. For one who is a citizen in the kingdom of Christ, what difference, what effect does that have on those that are around us? Let's pick up and read verses 11 and 12 together. It says, You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you look at your outline this morning, you'll see the first point is this. It is, uh, number one, the, that there is an insult towards kingdom living. And we see that in verses 11 and 12. Really, they are additional commentary of that final beatitude about persecution. Uh, but it, it also comes into play as we think about the effect that our witness has upon a watching world. So there's really two words that I want us to, to, uh, to notice this, this morning, two words for us to, uh, 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 to see as, as uh, key words for us to, to, to note. The first one is insult, and the second one is influence. And we're going to spend time talking about both of those key words today. And so when we think about, about uh, insult, we note that it says at the end of verse 11 that the insult is because of me. And that's what Jesus is saying in verse 11. In verse 10, when it speaks of persecution, it says that the persecution is because of righteousness. It's linked in to the way in which one is living for Christ. And so as we, as we look at these verses and you look at verse 12, it, it may surprise you when it says that we are to rejoice and be glad. We might, we might ask ourselves, really? Re rejoice? Be glad over, over insults or persecution, mockery? How, how can that be something that, would, that we would rejoice over? Well, really, it's a picture of what would one day happen in the early church. If you look at Acts chapter 5, verse 41, it's, it's giving a description of those in the early church who were uh, at the Sanhedrin court. And it says that they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name. The early church, think of the reaction, rejoicing to the fact that they themselves were being persecuted. That's because the early believers understood something. They understood that, that persecution was a sign that their testimony in Christ Jesus was being seen. Yes, by the Sanhedrin court in this case, but in other cases, it's the Roman Empire that is seeing the difference. In fact, there were some cities that, that knew that, that, that Paul and the missionary journeys that he was a part of had quite an influence upon the cities that, uh, that, that he would enter. And they would even use the phrase that, that these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And so this is part of the testimony of the early church, that they, that they knew that they were having an impact. Let me ask you this. If the Roman Empire or the Sanhedrin court had not been bothered by these individuals, what do you think would have happened? They, they probably would have questioned their own obedience to Christ if others weren't saying something, if others weren't insulting. Because as we saw last week, even Christ said, don't be surprised when they persecute you, for they persecuted me also. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, it's not saying if it will happen, it's saying when. This is reinforced in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. When it says, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
So church family, part of kingdom living is facing insult. Part of kingdom living is facing persecution. It's all done for the sake of Christ. It happened to him. It happened to the early church. It's happened throughout the ages and even for us today. For as long as we follow the principles and the teaching of this book, there will always be pushback. The more we hold to the teachings of Christ, there will be mocking. There will be insults. There will be persecution. Sometimes this happens on an individual level. Or maybe a family experiences it. Maybe it's a church family that can experience it when taking a a biblical stand on an issue that goes against the grain of the thinking of the day. I don't know if you heard about the good work that Samaritan's Purse is doing in New York City. Samaritan's Purse is a a Christian humanitarian relief organization. Uh, They go all over the world uh, giving assistance to those who are in need. And uh, some of their work involves medical work. In fact, one of our own church members has helped uh, to set up field hospitals in different parts of the world where where surgeries can can take place for for those who might not otherwise have an opportunity uh, to, to, to to have surgery or to have medical treatment. Well, in the, in the recent days of the COVID-19 pandemic, New York City was running out of hospital beds, and they were running out of ICU space and even ventilators. And Franklin Graham of the Samaritan's Purse said, we, we do field hospitals. We can do this. We could bring and set up a field hospital right in Central Park of New York City. And that's exactly what they did. They, 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 they responded to the call. They responded to the need. And have you heard what's happened in the days since then? They did get the field hospital set up, and they are, they are caring for people, and they have a number of beds, including several that are, that are considered ICU beds that have ventilators. But there was an outcry from some in New York City about Samaritan's Purse and about whether or not they should even be there. And it, it relates back to the, the, the statement of faith that the Samaritan's Purse ministry has upon the, the definition of marriage. And the outcry from, from the city has, has, really, uh, has, has really caused quite, a, uh, uh, quite a, uh, uh, a concern for those who have been, uh, been serving or those who have been needing the treatment. Um, I've got a picture of this that you can see, and you can find other, other pictures online if you want to see what it looks like set up there in Central Park. But here's what Franklin Graham said. He said, Samaritan's Purse is a decidedly Christian private relief organization funded almost entirely by individuals around the world who share our passion for providing aid to victims of war, disease, disaster, poverty, famine, and persecution, and doing so in Jesus' name. And he responded to these who were, who were protesting their work by saying it seems tone deaf to be attacking our religious conviction about marriage. At the very moment, thousands of New Yorkers are fighting for their lives and dozens of Samaritan's Purse workers are placing their own lives at risk to provide critical medical care. And Graham went on to say that that the organization has never asked the millions of people whom they've served to subscribe to their beliefs. He said, we are a religious charity and we lawfully hire staff who share our Christian beliefs, but we do not discriminate in who we serve. He goes on to say, we have provided billions of dollars of medical care and supplies, food and water, an emergency shelter without any conditions whatsoever. Our Christian faith compels us, like the biblical Good Samaritan, to love and serve everyone in need regardless of their faith or background. So as I, as I had heard these news reports over recent weeks, I would, I would say and ask, is it sad for us to hear about these attacks, uh, verbal attacks upon the, the, the work of Samaritan's Purse and upon its volunteers? Yeah, absolutely, it is sad. But is it surprising? I think the answer would be no, not really. It's not surprising because of what we see here. This is part of the Beatitudes. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount, that there will be times that we are insulted because of Christ or because of righteousness, because of kingdom living. Let's pick back up in uh, in verse 13 and read down through verse 16. We turn here, moving from insult now to influence. 
verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. Verse 16. In the same way, let your light, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Again, we move still under the theme of of affecting and influencing the world, but we move from from insult, insult towards kingdom living, which we saw in verses 11 and 12, to influence of kingdom living. And all of this is, is part of our witness of being followers of Christ. Now, I know these are probably familiar verses to us. They provide two metaphors which speak of influence, salt and light. And uh, even though there will be uh, some out there who despise our testimony, there will also be some out there who are attracted to it. They will be drawn to it. And so we we know there'll be an insult, but we also know that there will be influence. You know, as, uh, as people, we are not meant to live life in isolation. Although just as soon as I say those words, I know that for right now, we do live in isolation, but, but we know that the big picture is that we're called to live in community, and we're called to, to live with other people and to know other people and be a blessing uh, to others. And so to interact with, with, with people in different levels will, will generate some attention because the ways of Christ's kingdom are different than the ways of the world. If we blend right in, or listen to me, if we happen to change our beliefs to match the ever-changing and confusing standards of the world, then no, we are not part of Christ's kingdom. But if we are in his kingdom, we will hold fast to his word, and we will live in a way that is distinct. And that's when we see the effect that happens. And sometimes that, that effect brings on insults, but other times it provides influence. So as we live the Beatitudes and follow the ways of the Sermon on the Mount that we'll be looking at in the uh, the weeks to come, we will indeed see a distinction for being a citizen in the kingdom. In these verses, the distinction is pictured as salt and light. So let's look first of all at salt. You'll notice in your outline that uh, that I've noted uh, three characteristics of salt. Salt preserves, salt flavors, and salt creates thirst. And I think you could look at those statements and and think, how does one's walk with Christ provide these to those who are around us? In the ancient world, salt was used primarily as a preservative. Since they didn't have uh, the the deep freeze refrigerators or other ways of being able to preserve uh, meat, salt was what was used. And so we oftentimes think of salt simply as a a flavor enhancer, but in those days it was critical for being able to uh, preserve meat uh, for an extended period of time and even vegetables. And so uh, in thinking here about the metaphor of of salt, we see that, that, that God's people are called to have a preserving influence upon the world around us, around the community, around the, 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 the society, the country, the culture that we are in. As we look at verses 3 through 12, the Beatitudes, we see that, 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 uh, that, that these cannot but, but help but be a good influence in the world that is around us. But verse 13 asks us about salt that loses its taste, loses its influence, and I would, I would say that, that, that the idea here is for the salt to, to, to be a preservative, that it must, it must be at work, it must be used, and for us to have a, an influence upon the world around us, that, that we are to, to, to be uh, working against the decay of this world. We are to be bringing truth into the, into the lives of those who need it. I came across a sermon preached by John Stott on this very passage. And the late John Stott made an interesting comment in 
his message that I'd like to, uh, to share with you. He said, if in the community there is more violence than peace, if there is more indecency than modesty, more oppression than justice, more secularism than godliness, is the reason that the church is not praying for these things. And I just, as I read that quote, I just stopped reading the sermon for a minute. And I just thought about about the community that we live in, the greater St. Louis area, and thought about, about the statistics that have to do with crime and violence and murder. Just thinking about, about that and oftentimes recognizing what, what I would perceive are some of the, the, the reasons behind it. But to stop and think about it in, in light of, of being salt in this community, it, it gives us a different look at it, doesn't it? Because we have responsibility to be a preserving influence, that we are to be coming in and, and assisting in whatever these issues are. It really struck me as I thought about our own city. When we see things that are falling apart around us, what is our response? I mentioned violence and crime. We could also talk about racism. We could talk about issues within, within marriage and family. You see, we're called to be salt, a preserving influence. Not because we're experts on all of these things, but because we're representatives of Jesus. Let me ask you, church family, do we believe that the gospel provides answers for these issues, these social ills, these these problems of the human condition, the, 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 the sin nature coming forth? Do we believe that the gospel has answers? Do we believe that Jesus coming in and being at the center of one's life provides answers, provides hope? I read that right now during the pandemic, about one out of every six relationships are experiencing tremendous strain. One out of six. Do we believe, again, that the gospel has an answer? That it, has, that it makes a difference when, when Christ is at the center of a relationship? And it's not just relationships. As we, as we think about the pandemic around us, Addictions are another issue. I, I read that the sale of, of alcohol right now is, is at record levels. There's also financial problems with unemployment rolls growing. I also saw just this morning an, an article that nearly half of all Americans report that their mental health has been negatively affected by stress over the virus. Just think about that. The, 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 the needs of, of mental health right now for us all, but even particularly for some who are already vulnerable in the area of mental health. Now, when we see that, that, that the world is, is, is spiraling out of control for someone, or we look at someone and we see that, that, their, that their world is, is, is falling apart, what is our response? What is the easiest response? The easiest response is just to, 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 to look the other way, right? The easiest response is to say, hey, that's, that's not my problem. I don't want to be involved in that. Every man for himself. That's not my circus. Those aren't my clowns. I'm, I'm out of here. We'll let them handle their own mess, right? Let me ask you, church, is that how we're called to live, just to walk away? Because with salt being the preserving influence, coming alongside and, and, and really helping to prevent decay, that's a job for you and me. That's calling for us as kingdom citizens to see the need and not turn an eye away from it, not to walk away from it, but to walk up to it, to walk up to those in need to assist. You'll notice in your outline there are A couple of discussion and reflection questions that I want you to think about. In fact, if you're with a group this morning, I want you to take a minute to discuss these. Here they are. In what ways can you be a preserving influence in the world today? And it gets very specific. Who around you has a life that is falling apart? How can you help? Take 60 seconds where you're at and discuss with your group some answers to these questions.
Well, as we come back in together here and we think about being a preserving influence for the world around us, my mind goes to what's going to take place this coming Thursday. It's the National Day of Prayer. And all of those issues that I just mentioned, all of those topics, and maybe even the situations that that you have just been uh, discussing there together in your home, uh, they, they may be a list in in and of themselves of of prayer requests, of prayer needs, of concerns that you could spend some time this Thursday praying about. I encourage you to look at the National Day of Prayer website, look and see. I know it's going to look different this year than previous years, uh, but there is still that effort, still that initiative. And I don't know if there has been a, a greater need in recent years for prayer and prayer for our communities and our nation than there is right now. So let's, uh, let's make that a priority as we look to Thursday of this week. Well, now as we, as we continue in the text, we're going to look at the, the final metaphor, and that is light. And if you look in your outline there, you'll notice that I've added a few characteristics of light. Light reveals, light guides, and in the case of Matthew chapter 5, light is described as being good work. And so uh, we as Christians are the light of the world. And as we think about that, it, it reminds us that, that even though God has created this world and that it's a beautiful world, one that we are to care for and appreciate and that we, that we see God's beauty reflected within, we also know that it's a fallen world and that there are implications from the, the fall into sin and the bondage to sin. And we see the darkness all around us, but yet we see that, that our responsibility is to bring light, to be the light of the world. The light symbolizes truth because it exposes what is present. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, maybe a commercial or or, uh, uh, an advertisement for for a carpet cleaning business that likes to to show uh, how they are able to clean carpet. If you've got a, a room where there's some smells in the carpet and you don't see anything and they come in and what do they do? They turn on a black light and then all of a sudden, you can see the stains, you can see the soil in and, and different parts of the room. I, I thought about putting a, a picture up on the screen for us, but, but I thought on second thought, maybe I wouldn't do that. You get the idea. Light can expose. Light can reveal. And oftentimes, that's what God's Word does. And that's what the lives of believers are to do. They are, they are to reveal what is true. And so as we, as we, uh, as we think about this analogy of, of light We know that it reveals truth, but it also guides the way. Look at Psalm 119, verse 105. It says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. So God's word also gives guidance. It shows the way. It shows us how to go forward. It it illuminates what is around us. It's 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 a metaphor that's just filled with all kinds of imagery. But that, that, that idea of being light is part of our identity as citizens of Christ's kingdom. That we are to be light to those who are around us. And we're going to talk at the end of the message on, on how that can specifically be done right here and right now. But I want to point out that the rest of the Sermon on the Mount will help us to better understand what this life will look like. We're going to be looking at a lot of different practical topics in the coming weeks. Verse 15 tells us that the light is not to be placed under a basket. Uh, Verse 16 says that the world should see the light and even describes the light as good works. And ultimately, that God is to be glorified. That it's not the doer of the works, but it's, it's God, it's Christ who is to be ultimately glorified. The light points to Him. Now, the world around us is to be influenced by the light, by these good works of the believers. And, and as we stop and think about, about the world today and, and we look back in, uh, in, into history, we can, we can see the way in which the body of Christ has been light, how it has been uh, the doer of good works. In fact, a medieval historian by the name of Brian Tierney points out, he says this, and I quote, by the Middle Ages, this idea that every human being is made in the image of God began to develop the idea of inalienable human rights for everyone, no matter what the race, what the class, no matter what the social status. So what we see here 
as we go back in to the annals of history, is that we see that there was influence. There was influence happening uh, from the church, from Christians. We could go even all the way back into uh, uh, to the uh, to some of the early spiritual Christian lead- leaders, even back into the third and fourth century, and and find how how they were promoting the idea of of the imago dei, the image of God. And that, they, that even back in that time, there's examples of how, how they were uh, protesting slavery and other, other uh, abuses of, of humanity. A, Ger- a German philosopher by the name of Jorgen Habermas says this. He said, the ideals of freedom, of conscience, human rights, and democracy is the direct legacy of the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of of love. Now that we could we could stop and spend a, spend a lot of time right now even talking about the worldview that is others centered versus a worldview that is self centered, a view that that in, in which others centered would would be thinking about the needs of someone else or the human dignity of someone else, and to see that it was it was the Christian ethic that that brought into play and into consideration what it means to care for others. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr. also spoke of the image of God. He said this in one of his sermons. He said, you see, the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. The whole concept of the imago dei, the image of God, is the idea that all men had something within them that God injected. Every man has a capacity to have fellowship with God and thus gives him a uniqueness. It gives him a worth. It gives him a dignity. And we must never forget this as a nation, that there are no gradations in the image of God. All people, all people created in the image of God. And that mindset alone affects the way that we respond to those around us. Let me just briefly mention a few things that that came to mind as I was preparing the message. Over the years, the the ways in which the, the body of Christ has been light to the world. We've already spoken about Samaritan's Purse, but, but just think in general about medical care. I'm, I'm often reminded when I, when I make hospital visits of the names of hospitals, so many that are, that are biblical names, that are Christian names, and that's because so many of the hospitals were founded by, by, by Christians. They were founded by people of faith that, that believed in caring for the needy among us. I read uh, an article a year or so ago about the number of hospitals in sub-Sahara Africa, and that even into recent years, that there was a statistic saying hardly any of them have been created other than the work of Christian missionaries. You see, it was the, it was the body of Christ years before the government, years before, before any infrastructure was in place where a government could help with medical needs. It was believers caring for the needy caring for the sick, caring for the wounded. We could also talk about the abolition of slavery or the abolition of child labor, lots that could be, could be spoken of, the care of orphans, the care of elderly, even assisted living uh, communities and places and how the faith community has been behind so much of this, the care for single moms, recognizing the needs that they, uh, that they oftentimes have. You just look over and over again and you see Christian ministries there ready to assist. I was also reminded of counseling ministries, mental health, addiction, recovery ministries. If you look into this world and you begin looking to find assistance, you can find assistance from Christians because they've been there and they've been ready to to help and provide for those in crisis. Beyond mental health, we think of, 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 of humanitarian crisis, of relief work. The Red Cross was started by a Christian businessman. We think about the Salvation Army. We could even turn our attention to education and think about the uh, influence of Christians upon institutions of higher learning. I would encourage you to go back and read some of the history of even some of the elite universities within our nation. Read the history of Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and it may surprise you about the distinctly Christian heritage of each one. 
In fact, it's not been uncommon to see some of these well-known universities even going back trying to, uh, to, to, to reinvent themselves and to, to come up with different mottos and rewrite their history at times because it was clearly, clearly set up with Christian principles. Now, have you ever wondered why the atheists and agnostics didn't lead the way? You ever wonder why they, they've not led the way in these areas of, of caring for the poor, of helping those who are sick? coming alongside those who, who need assistance with, with recovery or addiction or, or other, other needs. Why is it that the atheists and agnostics are not there? Just think for a minute about Darwinian thinking. Does it have anything to do with helping those in need or helping someone who is weak? Not at all. It's about survival of the fittest. And so the Christian worldview comes in and says, we understand our role we understand our call from God to be salt and light, to be a preserving influence, to come and bring light into a particular situation, to give physical help, real help when it is needed. Well, just think, church, if the whole Western world has been influenced through the ages by the, the force of the Christian church, just think about how one church can have influence upon one community. Think about that. As we wrap up this morning and we, we see the, the Sermon on, on the Mount and helping us to have the idea of being a witness to the world, this idea that, that even as we face insults, we are to have influence. We are to live lives of impact. And so I, I have a, another reflection question. We won't stop to discuss it, but I'd like you to think about it. It says this, where are we to influence? Where should we be salt and light? And I think that, that there's a lot of good answers to this question. And we could certainly think about, about our work in, in other parts of this world. But we also need to be thinking about the work right here in front of us. In fact, I, I remember hearing a quote many years ago. I don't know who to attribute it to. But it says that the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. And so that's for us to shine bright today, to shine bright even in the midst of a pandemic. We know that there are needs all around us, and we as the people of God, the children of Christ, citizens in His kingdom, it's our time, it's our time to be living in the kingdom, to let the world see and to, to experience the good works that God's calling us to. Now, I want to say that some of that opportunity is probably already happening, and you may not have known it. Maybe you've been a part of a school board. Maybe you've been a part of a neighborhood association. Maybe you, you, you serve in the community vocationally as a police officer or firefighter. Maybe you think about, about uh, uh, serving on the, on the city council, being in, involved in community affairs. Do you know what you're doing? You're being light. You're being salt. You are bringing that influence to each and every one of those groups. As you think about, about the workplace, as you think about the classroom, as you think about the neighborhood, you, church, are salt and light. These are all examples of where we can and should be an influence for the gospel. So what's the point? As we wrap up, let me just say we are needed. We are needed. We're here on this earth for a very important mission. And our work for the, of the gospel is seen in the good works. But let us remember the goal. The goal stated here in verse 16 is to glorify our heavenly Father, that others too may see Him, that others may know Him, that others can, can walk through those Beatitudes just as you have and enter His kingdom. So as we wrap up this morning, let's bow together, let's pray, and ask God to apply His Word. Would you join me as we pray? Our great God and heavenly Father, we thank You for the Sermon on the Mount, and we thank You for the truth that is found within and God, as we consider the call to be faithful to you, we are mindful to think of those that are, that are suffering today for the cause of Christ, for those who are taking on the insults and the mocking, but even those who are taking on deeper persecution, maybe imprisonment, maybe even martyrdom. Father, we pray for the, for the cause of Christ to grow, to grow in our own community, but to also see that salt and that light be an influence for this entire world because you are worthy. Your name is worth everyone hearing. 
and everyone knowing, having an opportunity to find Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us now, each of us to be salt and light where you have placed us. May we be found faithful. May we, may we walk towards those we know who are going through a time of need. And may we offer assistance, tangible help in this hour. Lord, we thank you for being our God, for being our King, and for giving us your word to guide our steps. We pray now that you will take them, that you will apply them, and that ultimately you would be glorified. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. church we want to thank you so much for joining us today we hope you've been blessed by the worship this morning by the preaching of god's word church have a blessed day and we'll see you back here next week